good Wednesday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am back in the, the house, in the studio, uh, talking uh, our last Wednesday edition of each month. We talk Crossing All Borders, which is the biggest international news here around the world. And this one's a little bit different, though. This one is what's happened in the last 12 months. And today we have the, uh, the color commentary to conservative like me podcast host Jen Sanford her father her her uh sparring partner on the conservative like me podcast host John Sanford John thank you so much for doing this and I'm looking forward to being your sparring partner for the next hour Chris thanks very much for uh, the introduction I'm great it's great to be here looking forward to uh to the discussion today awesome um, over the last 12 months, we have seen some major news stories break around the world. Um, I, I, I want to start with this gen- generalized question for you, John. The last 12 months, uh, what, how, would you cap, uh, how would you encompass the last 12 months in, on the international, scale, uh, the st- international stage? You, you know, I think that you know, because Canada is such a small country and you you take a look at how global the world is, uh, you know, the things we're going to talk about tonight, uh, I I think really are representative of what's going on around the world. You know, there's a certain amount of chaos uh, in in countries, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how they're dealing with things like COVID and and the economy. Uh, You know, I think we're seeing uh, so much of a universal change in the way we go about our business. And, and by our business, I mean, you know, walking out the door, how we communicate, social distancing. It's one of those, one of those things that is going to change the way we interact with people, probably uh, for generations. And it's happening everywhere in this world. It, it is such a, a, a global change in the way we're going to commute, uh, the way we're going to engage in work, um, and, and I'm not talking COVID per se. I mean, that, that, that's the catalyst. Uh, but in, in, in terms of um, just the way we view people and the way we look at uh, global trade, and, and uh, uh, it's just so different in, in 2021 than it's been uh, in, in any other decade. We were going to start with a different topic, but you mentioned COVID-19. So I want to start there because I think that is the biggest, if not the the only news story that a lot of people were talking about this year in 2021 on the international stage, particularly now with the rise of the Omicron uh, variant out of Europe and South Africa. Not sure exactly where it started, but the South African government did identify it. So people are assuming that is the South African variant, but it's not. It was first discovered in uh, Europe and then it was identified in South Africa. I want to ask this to you. Um, as someone who follows uh, international news, as someone who follows politics, how has Canada done on the world stage when it comes to COVID-19 and the rollout of the vaccines, the handling of the restrictions, and the op- reopening up of our uh, borders to the Americans? And I know it's a lot of, to unpack, but I'm going to let you take the stage here for a few seconds. But how has Canada done on the world stage when it comes to COVID-19, in your opinion? Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, understanding that we were in the midst of a, a pandemic and what that means, you know, Canada, like every other country, that doesn't have any recent history of this. I, I think you have to go back to World War I, you know, in terms of that, uh, that flu that, you know, soldiers brought back and, and the impact it had on, on Europe and Canada and the United States. So, you know, trying to understand the start point, I, I think, is probably the biggest problem for, for any government. And I, I think Canada uh, fell into that, that whole world of what's going on. How big is this? Uh, you know, what's going to be the impact on, on, on people. And I think once, once the government uh, got its mind around the severity of this, I think the domino started to fall into place and um, it was pretty evident that it was going to take something like a vaccine to, to, to fix this, but what do you do in the meantime? Uh, so I think that, you know, in terms of closing borders, um, I, 
I mean, as a Canadian, that seems so strange that you're closing borders because we live in such an integrated trade world. You know, you're looking at, at uh, um, you know, how do you get goods from one place to the other when the border is closed? And, and then you had all of those, we have to safeguard our own um, um, uh, country and, and population. And you see, you know, the drug, um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical world, you know, start to seize up and, and they were looking after the place of origin where, where these drugs are, are produced. And, you know, you're starting to see people working on vaccines and it's like, who's going to get it first? And uh, what does it look like from a perspective of the uh, European Union sharing with Canada? And what does Canada have to do and say, you know, to be put at the top of the list? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to give the Liberal government here uh, some pretty good marks on this thing. I, I don't agree with all of it, but I think that, you know, when you're flying blind and you're trying to figure this out as you go, um, you know, the vaccines got done and it may not have been perfect, but we got them. Um, and uh, the, the, the piece now is when does it end? Because one of the things that I believe that COVID has brought to Canada and, and to the United States and, and to a lot of countries, the European Union is a more authoritative, authoritarian type of government where they've gotten very used to telling the citizens, this is what's in your best interest. This is what we're going to do. This is how you'll queue up. This is what we want you to get. This is how long you have to wait. Um, and, and I think that uh, that's going to be the interesting transition because you know, Canada has done it. And, and in Canada, you see it, I think, at all three levels. You've got the federal government with the oversight in terms of the demands that they're placing on the provinces. And you got the provinces telling people what to do. And then you got municipalities that, you know, we've got to declare a state of emergency because we want to be able to tell you what to do as well. And somewhere in all of this, you got 37 million people wandering around thinking like, hey, how do I get back to square one? How do I get back to what my life used to be? Uh, so I think that there's a lot of good here. There's a lot of good here. The government, I think, has done yeoman service to try and save lives in, in a very precarious situation. But so much has fallen out of this, Chris, you know, in terms of how we deal with our seniors and, you know, long-term care centers and, and how we communicate and, you know, who comes first and who comes second and in terms of the big pecking order in life. And so long, long answer. Sorry about that. But I, I you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with the liberals on this one. I think they've done a pretty good job. Now, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here because that's what I like to do on this show is we, we have people in this country who don't want to get the vaccine, who by personal choice, by religious beliefs, by whatever you want to call it, do not want to get the vaccine. You have that down in the States. You have that across this world where people do not want to get the vaccine. We are seeing the rise of variants across this world with the Delta first earlier in the summer. I think in July, it was first discovered in the United Kingdom and now the Omicron. Are we in a perpetual rotation, the sort of the uh, rotating door of variant after variant because people just will not want to get it? Or are we in a world now where we, we, we now have to live with this COVID-19 as for good or bad, this is the new normal because I think there's a lot of people, and I think this is on the international stage because I, I look at Australia for being one of them. They they want to get back to normal. They want to throw open the doors. They want to throw open the borders. But each time they have to lock down, and it pisses people off, and it gets uh, some people angry. And there's some riots that happen in countries like Australia. Are we are we destined to be in this revolving door of variant after variant after variant, and this will never go away? Or do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Because we, we have to start preparing for that, right? We can't just be sitting here and playing catch up after a new variant comes along. We have to start trying to get back to normal, don't we? Well, I think it's a question of, of understanding that um, th this pandemic is, is not over. Like I was optimistic at, at um, uh, Delta two that, that we were gonna see the light at the end of the tunnel. So it's with some disappointment that we have a new variant that, that we're now considering what the response is going to look like. But having said that, we have to have a different relationship with this pandemic. And I think we need to understand that it's out there and we need to, to learn to live with it in, in some way. And I thought that the two vaccines were, were going to be that passport to, to a, a better understanding of how we could co-live co with, with, um, with Delta. Uh, 
but I think that, you know, there's, there's two pieces to this in my mind, uh, Chris, you know, one is, is that I don't think we're done this. And I, and I, I think there's, there's going to be more of this. Uh, but I think we just have to figure out how we're going to adapt as a society uh, to this and, and the way we live our lives and the way we, we, we function uh, in, in, a, in a world environment. But having said that, I, I'm not 100% convinced that I buy into the notion that this is being perpetuated by people that have not been vaccinated. And I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I, I'm vaccinated there. It's on the record. Um, but I expected more for my two vaccinations. I, I expected that some of my life would return to normal. And quite frankly, it hasn't. I'm still told to social distance. I'm still told to wear a mask. I, I have to uh, uh, prove that I've got both my vaccinations by a, a card reader. Um, I, it, it's, it's a real pain in the ass. And I actually thought it was going to be a better outcome. But let's talk for a minute about the people that aren't vaccinated. You know, we live in a, in a country, Canada, where, you know, we, we had this notion that uh, we were all in this together until we found out we weren't all in, in this together. And, and we've now separated out, in, I think, in a big, big way, uh, the difference between those that are vaccinated and those that are causing the problem, which are the unvaccinated people. I don't believe all of these people that are unvaccinated are the problem. I think they've got legitimate concerns about the rush to delivery uh, of these vaccines. I, I think that they, 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 whatever the reason is, uh, is their reason. And, and, and I, I don't want to step in and say they're entitled to their opinion without regard to outcome. But you've got a choice, you know, and, and we've always said that there was a choice. You could get the vaccine and your life was supposed to be better, or you could get tested with a rapid test. And, if, and if, if it came back negative, you could go about your business. And somewhere along the line, we've said, no, that's not good enough anymore. We need everybody to be vaccinated because we want everybody to be the same. And we're treating people that are unvaccinated differently. And uh, is that the Canadian way? Like, like I, I, we I, gave 2000. We gave, Jack, we, but isn't it though? We, we've always well, done that as a society to... Uh, quarantine people whether and we we do not have the best record on human rights in this country and i will i think anyone will agree with that so when it right. comes to is this just our new and it's more of on a uh, global scale our our worst human rights record where we go and we say okay there's two type of people now there's the vaccinated and the unvaccinated if you're vaccinated you can go on a plane you can go on a train you can go travel across any country but if you're not vaccinated you're shit out of luck pardon my french and you have to sit and do absolutely nothing. Um, and you have to basically suck it up because this is the way the world works. And every government's on board. If you don't want to, you're going to be left behind. Yeah, f f fundamentally, I, I, I don't disagree with that statement, Chris. The issue, though, is, is for me, is that, um, is it that simple? You know, for example, I walk up to an airport and I show them my QR code and I get on the plane and off I go somebody walks up and they have a negative test. So, you know, at that particular point, they don't have COVID and they get on the plane. So everybody on the plane doesn't have COVID. When we come back, I get on because I've got a vaccination um, and they get on because they've got a negative COVID test and we all come home. And, and theoretically, nobody on the plane has COVID. Um, why does it need to be either or? And, and like I said, if I had my preference, because I just want to interject here, if I had my preference, we would all be vaccinated, we would all be traveling on the same road here together, and there wouldn't be this, 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 this push and pull between, I took the time to get the vaccine and, and look at how well I am, you didn't get the vaccine and well, you don't have COVID, you might. We all might get COVID. And, and, I, and I think that as we look at this new variant, uh, they're stymied in terms of what to do next. So it takes us right back to the beginning of, of COVID. Let's close borders. Even though we've got what huge percentage of Canadians that are vaccinated, huge percentage, theoretically we should all be in in you know in in pretty good shape to withstand another variant, but we just don't know anything about it. So we're right back to, okay, you've been vaccinated, but we need some time to figure out what this new uh, uh, variant is going to mean to Canadians. You you talked earlier on in the first about five minutes about trade, trade being disrupted because of COVID nineteen because of the lockdowns. Now. 
I, I would I would say I haven't seen that. I, I still get my groceries. I still get all my goods and services that I've gotten beforehand. Um, everything comes to my door. I, I get my oil. Yes, oil prices are going up, and we're going to talk about inflation later on in the episode. But what do you mean by trade disruption? Because I don't see it, and maybe I'm not I'm not looking at the same goods you are. But I I, I just over the last fifteen months. The only thing that's changed is I have to sit on my butt and watch TV and not go out and go to a movie theater anymore. Yeah, so I think what I'm talking about is is when you look at the um, uh, supply chain mess that they've got in Vancouver that occurred before the floods. And, okay. and okay. Uh, uh, you know, you cannot get... Um, um, you, transporting goods from China uh, or anywhere in, in that part of the world is practically impossible because there's just simply no containers uh, to, 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 to ship goods. So I'm talking about things like uh, when we first got into this whole pandemic, uh, some basic pharmaceutical things like you know blood pressure medication that, that is produced uh, in India, for example, uh, was no longer available and had to be rationed, as, as an example. So we see that kind of disruption in the supply chain um, you know, we see, uh, you know, electronics, we see um, uh, uh, chips that they put in cars uh, to, to, to make them operate properly, uh, to deal with all of the electronics that make a car go in a straight line. That, that kind of disruption, uh, you know, I think it's a little, little deeper than, than we think it is. Uh, I think that supply chain is, is fundamentally flawed now uh, in, in terms of just being able to move goods. Um, I think some of it is, is actually being incurred by governments that have disrupted the uh, supply chain uh, by their actions, as opposed to just a shortage of goods. But don't forget, when you, when, you, when you shut down an economy worldwide for as long as we did uh, with the first um, uh, uh, strain of, the, of this uh, pandemic, the world really stopped. People were sitting at home in their, uh, uh, in their, in their 600 square foot condos watching the world go by. And um, because we really didn't have a mechanism to understand how to work if we weren't all in a tall building. And uh, so I think th that, that that's my, my description of, of the supply chain in, in terms of, uh, I, I think we're a long, long way from that operating properly. So who are those players that you're talking about? Because you just mentioned that there are some governments that are potentially doing some things to negatively affect this uh, negatively negatively affect the supply chain who are you talking about is it china is it russia because those are the two players that canada well china being number one being the one that we deal with on a regular basis like the u.s but is there other ones that i'm not looking at right now you know i think china is probably the best example chris you know in terms of they closed the ports um, you know, there was just simply no uh, cargo ships and containers to load anything because nothing was being produced. And the lockdown was, was, was so significant in, in China, uh, you know, in terms of the expectation the government had of their citizens in terms of you will not go outside. It turned cities into ghost towns and uh, um, you just can't flip a switch and, and regenerate the kind of uh, shipping uh, and exports that, that, that China uh, would ship in the course of a, uh, a calendar year. It's, it's just, it's so broad and so, so significant that uh, uh, the world just can't catch up uh, just because the, the harbor is opened. So and, and the other piece is you, you've got it going somewhere else, but we know that there's a shortage of truck drivers. Uh, you can only get rail to, to get so much in, 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 you know, in, into the assembly line, you know, in terms of getting it into stores. Uh, but I think China would, would be kind of the number one. And then I think you see it in some of the European unions, you know, especially with, um, uh, you know, things like um, uh, the actual vaccine, where the EU wanted to make sure that there was enough for the EU before it was being shipped all over the world, because they didn't want to get left behind uh, in, in terms of what their needs were. That's the kind of intervention that I think you're seeing from uh, from governments. You are the, like you are a master of segue, Miss uh, John. I appreciate that <laughs> because you you brought up a good subject because there are countries right now who are struggling to get the vaccine, whether they can't afford it, whether they aren't able to access it, whether they can't store it in the proper facilities due to the fact that they may not live in a quote unquote first world country. Canada rushed to get the vaccine. They uh, they made packs with Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, Moderna to get shipments of the vaccine. 
Uh, Joe Biden said, no, we're, we're keeping it here. Like you said, the EU said we're keeping it here. Now we are seeing third world countries being left behind and variants spark out of it. Has the, the attitude of the first world countries come first and then everyone else gets left behind screwed over the world because now we are seeing the rise of variants that we could have stopped if we, were, we, we took a all in this together approach? You know, it, it's really difficult for, I think, a government to say, uh, we're going to put all of these people before you. And, and, and I think the Liberal Party would, would, would have stressed out about doing that as well. Uh, what I would say, though, is I think the Liberal government or, or the Canadian government um, has been very generous with sharing uh, the vaccine. I, I, you know, you see more and more evidence that they've sent, you know, 10 million here, or 10 million there. Um, I, I, th I think that's very generous of the Canadian government and they're to be applauded for that. Um, but like I said, I don't know how you tell Canadians that we're going to fix every second, every, every, every second world country, uh, and then we'll come back to you. Um, I, I think it's, it's just institutionalized that you look after your people and, 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 and then you're, you are as generous as you can be. And I think that that, that speaks volumes about Canadians. I'm not surprised that we're sharing. Uh, our vaccines with 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 African countries, uh, so that they can get vaccinated and, and move on with their lives. So it brings up a good subject because earlier on in the year, when the vaccine was starting to roll out, it slowly started getting produced, and people were getting it in America. Canada took the uh, the decision to take vaccines from the Covax supply, which is the supply that goes to third world countries who cannot afford the vaccine. This did not sit well with international governments and international organizations. How, how can Canada come out of this looking good? Is it just saying, okay, we're giving it all back. Here's 10 million because the damage is done, isn't it? Isn't our reputation already uh, sort of tainted by even taking vaccines away from third world countries when they were trying to get it as well? Or did we do the right thing? You know, we probably didn't do the right thing, but we did what we did. <laughs> and sometimes your reputation uh, uh, is subject to modification throughout the, uh, uh, the, the process of, of, of events. And in this particular situation, do I wish they hadn't done it? Should they have, should they have done it? No, no. Um, there was going to be lots of vaccine to go around. And, you know, as it turned out, um, you know, we have so much of a surplus uh, we probably didn't need it, and nor did we need the the that event on on our Canadian record. Uh, but I think we can make this right, and and I think the government's doing a a pretty good job of trying to make it right. Uh, you know, again, you just I it's hard to get your mind into a government official who is looking at what is what is the sense of urgency for Canada, and what is it that we need to do here. But the simple answer to your question: No, they shouldn't have done it. Where do we go from here? Where does Canada and the world go from here on the COVID-19 file? We are at the end of 2021, 2022, looks like we're gonna be dealing with the Omicron virus a variant. And if there's some other variant throughout the year, hopefully not, knock on wood. But where does the country and the world go from here, do you think? You know, I think that there has to be a, a meeting of the minds. And, and I think it, it, it starts with the World Health Organization. I think they need to be more uh, specific about what it is, what the message is they're selling. And I think, Canadian, I think the Canadian government and governments around the world have to have a line in the sand in terms of how long this is going to go on for and what does the new reality look like. I, and, and I don't believe that you can constantly close borders anymore. I, I think the world is just too integrated to be able to do that. Now, Anthony Fauci today was, was talking about you close a border for no other reason that you want a little bit of time to be able to study the variant and, and be able to come up with a recommendation. I disagree. I, I think that these are all smart minds. And, you know, if, 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 if this variant is in 23 countries already, there's lots to study. Get studying and let's get going. Um, but I think we have to understand, is our reality, the, the way we've lived our lives in the past, is it changing today? And, and what, that's, what is that going to look like? And, and I think it's widespread. Um, you know, we talked about it briefly, but 
you know, do people go back to skyscrapers and, 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 and work in, in cocoons? Uh, do they stay at home and work there? And, and, and what does productivity look like and how do we measure it in the future? I think that we, we need to have a conversation about uh, what does gathering look like in, in, in terms of, you know, do you gather with the people you know and, and, and you don't have to have a mask? Uh, do you stop going out on a Friday night to have a glass of wine and you have it at your house uh, so that you don't have to wear a mask? I, I think it's that time of, of reckoning where we need to really understand has the world changed for us? I mean, you see with green energy, you know, we're talking about people not driving cars anymore. Everybody get onto a, a, a uh, local transit. Local transit's the last thing I'm getting on if, 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 there's, a, if there's a COVID uh, variance out there. It's the absolute last thing I'm going to yeah. get on. I, I'm not getting on the, the GO train. I'm not getting on the LRT. I'm not, I'm not doing any of those things, nor am I going to go into a building where there's um, uh, 25 of us in an elevator if I'm being told to social distance. And like, like that's the contradiction that we're starting to see. So I, I think what we really need to do is understand what will, what, will, what will be the future expectation of Canada citizens and the world's citizens in terms of how we interact and how we go about our work and how do we contribute to the economy and, and, and the moral fiber of this country? Um, but so, it, I think it needs to be different. So I was going to move on, but you just said something and I want to piggyback. I want to pick up <laughs> on that. And that is, you said what it is expected of Canadian citizens and what is expected of world citizens. Now, love him or hate him, Justin Trudeau is our prime minister. He has gone to COP26. He has gone to meet international uh, uh, prime ministers, presidents, uh, what, who name you. And each country has a different restriction level what comes to COVID-19. Some you don't need to social distance. Some you don't need to wear a mask. It's, it's a complete cluster of every world, have every country having their own unique idea of how this needs to be tackled do and you mentioned it briefly but i want to ask you point blank do we do we just need a government entity like the united nations or the world health organization to say okay guys let's let's make this all one because i we, we are getting a lot of mixed messages of what we can do and what we can't do because I see down in the States and people are going to concerts and they're having fun and Canadians are being left out because we have the exact same experience happening down in the States as we do in Canada. But it seems like America is a little bit ahead of the relaxation of the COVID-19 restrictions than we are. Do we just need to sit down and have a big boy conversation and say, guys, what is it going to take for all of us to get on the same page to have one unique policy when it comes to COVID-19? Or do we have to take this as a one country, one rule? Well, I, you know, I, I think that because the number of cases of COVID is, has an ebb and flow to it, part of the reason why you hear Australia letting up uh, or, or closing down uh, cities is, is because of that ebb and flow. And, uh, you know, I think that that's, world, that's a worldwide phenomena. Sometimes you got 10,000 cases, sometimes you got 100,000 cases. And you have to manage to the volume. Um, you know, in Canada, every, well, especially Alberta, everything we, seems to, we seem to do as a province is geared to the number of hospitalizations and the number of people in the ICU. And, and, and everything is geared to that. And it's one of the things that just drives me absolutely crazy. And I refuse to watch the six o'clock news is because I don't want to know what that number is because it used to have an impact on the level of forgiveness. And you could take a mask off. You could go to a concert, you could do something until the numbers got bigger and you shut everything down again. Um, I, I think it's kind of different. You know, the other piece to that though, Chris, is that, you know, countries are sovereign and, you know, the behavior of Americans, you know, where you pack 100,000 people into a football stadium, um, you know, go to it, boys, you know, have a good time. The problem with that is that the U.S. is seeing an increase in their COVID numbers again. And that's a direct reflection on their cavalier approach to opening up uh, the business of living your life. I think what I'm talking about is, 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 is some kind of meet in the middle solution in terms of um, Let's say that we have all of these countries with 100,000 cases of COVID. 
how do we allow people to live their lives as opposed to being sequestered in, 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 in that little condo of theirs? Like, like what, what, are, what are the rules, you know, in terms of how we live our life? Case in point, I was at the Jubilee the other day um, uh, for a concert. I went, loved it. Um, you know, to get in, you know, you have to show your QR code, you have to show your ID, uh, and then you make a beeline straight to the bar because if you order something, you can take your mask off, right? So that's what I do. I, I, I then go show my ticket, I get my seat, and it's like you have to have a mask on. So why do you have to have a mask on? Everybody in there is double vaccinated and they're not allowing anybody in uh, that, that, that doesn't have a, a reasonable clean bill of health, right? It's, uh, uh, so why can't we take our masks off there? Th those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. Like, at what point is, is it okay to start living your life if you've got a QR code that says you've been double vaccinated or you've got a piece of paper that says you don't have COVID? And so that, that, that's the piece that, 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 that seems to be so out of shape worldwide. Uh, you'll never ever be able to fix the ebb and flow of the number of cases. Um, but can you live your life uh, within the parameters of what we know to be science uh, today? Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. Um, we have spent a half hour on COVID-19 and we have a lot of other topics that we need to talk about. So I'm going to switch it up here if you don't mind. And we're going to Absolutely. continue on with our great discussion about the our neighbors to the south. Uh, literally six days into 2021, I think we are still feeling ramifications of that day, January 6, 2021. We are still seeing ramifications of that day in America politics, but also internationally as well. Um, there was a campaign rally outside of the White House uh, hosted by then President Donald Trump. He had Republican supporters and Republican voters at that campaign rally. That rally decided whether it be because of Donald Trump, whether it not be because of Donald Trump, there is still litigation going on about that, uh, decided that they were going to storm the Capitol to stop the voting of the electoral votes of or the counting of the electoral votes from the 2020 uh, US presidential election. This has changed democracy in America. Um, and we are seeing the rise of far-right Trump Trumpism politics spill over to other countries. To start off this topic, I'm going to ask you point blank here. Has that Trumpism politics made its way to Canada? You know, I, I think the, 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 the anger that we saw that date um, was something to behold, you know, in terms of, of what was going on there. Um, I think it was a shock to our system that democracy was being treated that way. Um, but having said that, you know, there, 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 is, there is a lot of history that, that led to that day. And, and, and part of it is that, you know, you, you had such a wonderful orator in, in, in the name of Barack Obama who gave people hope. I, you know, the State of the Union address he had me mesmerized with, 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 with the way he articulated a vision for the world. I, I, the problem you've got is it was eight years of nothing. I, I, you know, other than the State of the Union, it, it got pretty thin because he could never translate words into action. Along comes Donald Trump and he says, hey, 
I am going to put America first. And I'm going to give all of you people a reason to re-engage in politics because you're on the outside looking in. You've been, you've been disenfranchised. You have no role to play in Washington anymore. It, it's the keeper of people that are, are politicos and, 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 uh, and politicians. And I'm going to end that. So I think you're seeing, you know, Trump being defeated and all of a sudden there's this reaction, like we're being disenfranchised again. And, and what about us? Now to take that to Canada, you know, we wouldn't see that. That, that is not our, 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 our makeup. Do you not uh, think so you know, though? I, I'm gonna no, and, and, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna counter you on that because we we are seeing good. a yeah. fraction of the general public in the last election who went to a purple party, the People's Party of Canada, who believe they have been disenfranchised over the last few years. Uh, I, I'm not saying that they all did that, but the America first attitude is now the attitude for a lot of people. It's the me first attitude. Why haven't I gotten ahead? Why have I been disenfranchised from the uh, politics of Ottawa, from Washington, D.C., from London, England? When, when we see a rise in populist movements like Donald Trump, it is naturally going to spill over to one of its biggest neighbors, Canada. And Maxine Bernier has picked that up and ran with it, hasn't he? You know, I think uh, last time I checked, Maxine Bernier um, uh, lost uh, the election and uh, uh, is on the outside looking in. But I, I just want to go back to, to, to just finish one point here in terms of perspective. We have a government that won, what, 28% of the pop, 29% of the popular vote, forms a minority government, says that he has a very aggressive uh, agenda that he wants to put in place in the next 30 days before they all go on uh, uh, winter recess and don't come back until February. And then the first thing that happens is it's like, uh, but we're not going to do it in parliament. We don't need to be here. Like, let's just all go home. Let, you know, let's wake up in our jammies and, and, and hook up uh, uh, Zoom and we'll have a conversation. You don't see that in the U.S. Congress. It's, it's business. They're dressed and ready to go. And, and, and I think has some of that, has some of that laissez-faire, um, you know, okay. Okay. we're going to govern the way we want to. I did not think that this was going to be the topic we were going to debate on, John, but here we are. <laughs> okay. If you watch any house proceeding down the stage, which I watch C-SPAN a lot. I am a nerd when it comes to politics. I don't have a lot of things on my agenda these days. So most of my day is watching reruns of C-SPAN in like in, uh, the, uh, the UK, the uh, House of Commons proceedings, uh, Washington, D.C.'s uh, Congress. And you never see 535 members of Congress sitting in that room at the same time. Now with the... House of Commons, you do not see 338 members of Parliament sitting there at the same time, but you you just said you don't feel comfortable going into a room or an elevator where you can't socially distance. You cannot socially distance in the House of Commons at all. You may try, but you can't. There are some people who will not tell us what their vaccine, uh, uh, if they've gotten vaccinated, that's here nor there, love them or hate them. But there's a potential of an outbreak if there's people who are immunized, if they're compromised, if they have an immune system that's compromised, of going into a House of Commons, going into a workplace and getting a COVID variant in their body and potentially becoming sick. I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say I don't agree with hybrid sittings as well. There should be another way that we can do it, but I, I think we have to realize that until everyone tells us what their vaccine records are and if they've been vaccinated, I wouldn't want to sit in that room. I'm not sure about you, but I wouldn't want to sit in that room, even as an elected official. You know, Chris, if I thought that that was the sole reason why they weren't showing up in parliament, I would say, oh. yeah, absolutely. I think the issue is, is, is the prime minister's disregard for the institution of parliament. That's, that's a whole nother hour long conversation. You <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I agree that there's other underlying issues. It's just from my perspective, I don't go into like when I go to the hospital, it kills me to stop walking to that hospital because there are people who are sicker than me. And I, I have literally my only line of defense 
is a piece of paper over my mouth and nose and two vaccine shots that we're not sure if the Delta variant is going to stop it or the Omicron is going to, if there, it's going to be stopped. So uh, there's concern. So walking into another situation like that, I would be concerned as well. I agree that he does not hold the institution high. So it's probably a lot of things that he's doing. I just, I want to say that the House of Con the uh, U.S. Congress is the exact same way. They do not hold that in high regard as well. You never see all 435 representatives sitting in that room, even in the State of the Union. There's my there's my there's my TED talk for the day. Continue on, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know what? I, I'll accept that statement. I um, uh, I just you know I, I mean the politics in the United States is is so fractured between party lines. You know, fortunately for them, there's two. So you're either on one side or the other, whereas in Canada, you could be on a multitude of different sides, you know, in terms of how we go about doing our business here. But uh, yeah, no, point well taken. Um, so, you know, if... So continue on, sorry, and then I'll ask my question. No, go ahead, please. I'm going to ask this question. Has this tainted America's standing in the world? That day where people were actually up on the dais were 10 minutes beforehand, Mike Pence, the vice president at the time, was standing and counting the ballots as they were coming in, electoral votes as they were coming in. Has this changed the narrative and has this made America weaker on the international stage? Because people are now looking at them and saying, if you can't get your house in order, why should we listen to you on international issues? Yeah, I, I absolutely do believe it's it's tarnished the reputation internationally. I absolutely it's uh, uh, I mean, that was that was that was bizarre to watch. And, uh, uh, you know, I think I think, you know, we, we've got the appropriate witch hunt underway now in terms of, you know, who we're going to subpoena and, and uh, who we're going to blame. And I, and I think everybody is uh, is is looking at the um, uh, the top of the heap at uh, Donald Trump in terms of who they want to blame. You know, I think they've got an outcome that, you know, gee, if it can just be Donald Trump, then, you know, then, then we can tarnish the entire um, uh, Republican Party. The issue, though, is that as a standalone event, that is one thing. And, and, and I, I think that there's probably lots of Americans that are embarrassed by what happened there as well. Um, a lot of Republicans that are but, embarrassed by it, probably. Yeah. And, and the sequence of events is, is, is really along the line is that, you know, you, you take this event, which, which is so chaotic and, 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 and so unnecessary, and then you bring in a, in, in a Democratic um, uh, president who, in, in my opinion, struggles for world recognition, uh, whether it's just his laid back style or, you know, trying to navigate between progressives and, 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 and uh, uh, less progressive uh, Democrats, you know, in terms of trying to find uh, legislation that works, don't know, but you know it, it's it's basically the start of the end of America as as we knew it uh, in in terms of what happened that day in January versus where we are today. Uh, America is going through a, a, a transition, whether it was it was caused by uh, those events in January or whether it's caused by uh, the current uh, Democratic president that we have, don't know. Um, but the Americans are changing. Uh, they the way they want to be viewed uh, in in this world. I I would hope that uh, whenever we have uh, committees or the U.S. has committees, it seems like the whole government shuts down to ensure that this committee properly gets its funding. People are put in front of the, the committee to answer questions, and nothing else happens. And the news organization, love him or hate him, does not want to talk about anything else but that. But I want to, I want to, I want to say one last thing. In a free democracy, whether you love it or hate it, this is our new world because this is not just happening in America. It started with the rise in America, but you are seeing countries now having having to to adapt to the ever-changing global dynamics of their people. People are pissed off. And COVID-19 has put a pressure on it because people are just saying we're fed up with government. And Donald Trump is sort of has given us the voice to actually stand up and be heard, hasn't he? Because I, he, I, I think he, yeah, Donald, he has indeed. 
Donald Trump, ha- as much love him or hate him, and we, I, the, he did some good things. I will be the first to admit that. And he did some shitty things. And I'll be the first to admit that as well. But he has given the voice to the people who didn't have a voice. And governments aren't used to that, of people having a voice, are they? No, they're not. It's, you know, I think, um, um, I think government has become an inward focused uh, institution. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I often wonder who benefits from government. Is it the people in government? Uh, because it's, it's always difficult to understand how it flows down to me. And uh, um, so I think that, yeah, I, you know, and it's interesting to hear it, hear you say it, because I've always been a big, big believer that, that Trump gave Americans who were disenfranchised uh, with, the, with, with the government of the United States a voice, an opportunity, hope. Hope maybe is the word I'm looking for, you know, in terms of like, what, how do I get involved? I, how, who will hear my voice? Uh, who will do as I ask them to do? And um, I, I think that, I think that really irked the political establishment in the United States. And, you know, what, what's the goal of, of everybody in politics to get elected and stay elected? And Justin Trudeau has become the master of that. Find a wedge issue and just run with it until the day we're, we're done. Um, I, I want to stick with uh, the, the U.S. politics for a second, because this one is more international, but it starts in March of this year. And that is Afghanistan. Earlier this year in March from the, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the Rainbow Room, if I'm not mistaken, is the name that he said the speech in. President Joe Biden announced that he was going to withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan at a future date. Uh, I think he did. I think he did say in the summer. I don't think he said an exact date until later on. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, John. Uh, but literally, as Justin Trudeau was walking up to Rideau Hall for to call an election, the news broke that Joe Biden was pulling troops out of Afghanistan and everyone was evacuated. Um, Donald Trump tried to end the longest war that America had ever been in. Barack Obama tried to do it, but Joe Biden did it. And there was a lot of people who were in favor of it. And now they seem to be running for the hills and not saying that they were ever in favor of ending the world's longest war. But here we are. What did you make of that announcement of the final, the, the president finally announcing that they were going to pull out all troops? You know, I, I, I think it was, it was a long time coming and, and I think it was, it, it was appropriate. The only piece that I really don't understand about this is the order of events. And, and here's why. Usually when you have a strategy around pulling troops out of a country, and let's all think back to Vietnam because, because that's the last helicopter that flew off of the US embassy. Uh, usually you have the US uh, military intelligence having a, an understanding of, of where the combatants are in that country, what kind of time frame is going to be necessary to get troops out? Um, you know, what, 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 are, what are the logistics? How many planes do we have to have? How many people do we have to leave behind in terms of being able to get these planes out of the airport? Um, you know, how much inventory of, of munitions and, 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 and state-of-the-art military uh, do we have to get out? It seems to me that Joe Biden is talking about pulling out uh, U.S. forces without having a plan. Like usually when you've got 85 or 90 percent or 95 percent of everything out of the country, including all of those people that need to come who, who, who have assisted the U.S. military, then you make the announcement because then you're talking about a couple of plane loads of, of the U.S. soldiers that are kind of, you know, holding on to the airport uh, while everybody gets out of town. And then you make the announcement like, you know what, we're in the final stages, you know, we're, 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 we're going to be leaving Afghanistan. Instead, it was like, we're leaving Afghanistan at about the same time, enemy combatants are p- piling into the airport to basically put a stop to any evacuation opportunity the U.S. may, may have contemplated. So was it the right thing to do in terms of saying we're going to pull the troops out? I believe it was, absolutely. But was like you said, any- but like you said, there was no plan. 
And I'm not yeah, a military. The, there I'm, we are. I'm no military person. I'm no mil. I'm no general. I'm no four star general. I have no records of what knowledge the uh, chief of staff or the joint chief of staffs had at the time. But I would have to assume someone in some room said to Joe Biden or someone said, maybe we should pause for a second because we don't know X, Y, and C factor here. And there could be a potential of the Taliban who are making their advances every time we try to do something that they might take Kabul again if we do decide to leave and we make it a public announcement that this is the day we're going to leave. There had to be at least one person in that room saying that. I I, I just have to assume that, right? Yeah, I, I can't imagine uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would have said, yeah, Joe, you, you, you just pick a date and uh, we'll try and figure out how to work around it. I, I think the American uh, U.S. military establishment is 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 a lot brighter than that, and uh, uh, so that part of it may be on Joe. But to your bigger question, was it appropriate to to uh, uh, withdraw U.S. troops and and just let that sort itself out uh, as an Afghan matter? I, yeah, it was. Because it, because for those who don't remember, there was military like high tech military equipment left in the country. It wasn't like everything got wrapped up in a neat little bow and America picked up everything and they left. Things got left behind. Tanks, armored vehicles, assault rifles. Like the Taliban have probably gotten more arsenal in that day than they had ever gotten from any other country that they might have potentially been smuggling from. Oh, it was military gold mine. It's some of the most sophisticated military, military equipment that the U.S. have. So does, yeah, it was a debacle. It, it was just, it was just, it was the worst possible outcome. And it does, it didn't seem like any G7 leaders knew that this was coming either. Like usually George Bush called all the seven G7 leaders and say, Hey, we're going into Afghanistan. Will you come with us? Joe Biden, I think it, like it might've been sent by a text and Justin Trudeau might not have seen it, but it seemed like no one got the <laughs> message and Joe Biden did this unilaterally, didn't he? Well, I, I I do believe he did it unilaterally, but um, uh, I I would I would also say that the Canadian government dropped the ball in terms of getting interpreters out and and those people that that supported the Canadian military. Um, we I this prime minister has done a whole lot more with a whole lot less and and has been able to move uh, mountains to get uh, uh, migrants and 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 people that are you know crisscrossing the the globe into Canada. Um, we have a good history of being able to do this. Um, so, there was just simply I, what not a will to do it, or um, you know whatever it was. Uh, I think the Liberal government really dropped the ball in terms of the Canadian government dropped the ball, you know, in terms of supporting those people that supported Canadian troops. There are two countries who have used Afghanistan as their sort of potential in in the middle east and that is china and russia and when uh uh the u.s moved out china moved in china was the first country to sit down in qatar with the new in newly installed i don't like the newly overthrown government of uh, afghanistan the taliban leaders has china is China making the right move here or is America going to hopefully stand up and say, Hey, China back off. You don't need Afghanistan or just does, does even, does anyone take Joe Biden seriously anymore? Like I, I hate to use those words, but it seems like Joe Biden's the joke, like the joke grandfather that comes to the meeting and says something and falls asleep. Like you just don't expect him to be there for much longer because he's just going to fall asleep. So you just talk around him. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody in China is intimidated by uh, President Biden. And, uh, you know, in terms of what what China is doing in Afghanistan, I think it's brilliant. Really? Uh, they're not going in. Yeah, I don't I don't believe that uh, China is going in there uh, the way Russia and the United States went into Afghanistan. They're not interested in having a, a third war uh, with this country. They want the, the mining opportunities. They, they, they want to be able to build products with with uh, with what they see as the mineral content in Afghanistan. And 
they're, they're not going to, they're not going to do it through warfare. They're going to do it through trade. And I, I, I think in a broader sense, uh, China is doing this all over the world, you know, in, in terms of building out a, a trading empire uh, that is just going to make them so formidable. Uh, it's, it's just going to be amazing. But, you know, having a, having a big military like China has is good hip pocket d- diplomacy. Engaging people in, in, in a country where the economy is fundamentally collapsed by initiating trade agreements and, and trying to figure out how to move trade goods, because it's not going to be up to the Afghans to figure that out. China is, 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 is really good at building railroads and infrastructure, and, and uh, they seemingly have an endless pit of money to be able to, uh, to develop countries. Uh, we see that in Africa. But I think Afghanistan, this is brilliant on their part. I, I think this is going to resurrect the economy. This is going to create employment. Uh, this is going to create currency. Uh, and this is going to give China just one more avenue to build out goods that the world wants. The, the, the follow-up to that, though, is there's another player on the international stage who is looking at mineral rights as well. And they have made a play in the 80s and the early 90s for Afghanistan as well. And that is Russia. And Russia and China have, as much as they are buddy-buddy against the USA, when it comes to their own interests, they are always looking out for number one. Could this potentially spark a bidding war or potentially a war of economic proportions where China and Russia go after each other and destroy the world's economy, trying to figure out where they're going to get the mineral rights or if they're going to be able to win Afghanistan? Because Afghanistan is a key area in the Middle East as well. Yeah, I, 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 the, the style that Russia has in, in terms of supporting a country or propping up a corner is so different than what China is doing. Russia has a history of going in and being that wedge party where you've got two warring factions and they pick a side and, and they hope that they win and it's done through guns and, 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 and war and, and all the rest of it. And, and they're kind of the supplier of munitions so that you know, somebody can win. And uh, China's having no part of that. China, China is, is, is saying like, let, let's talk about what's here and let's, let's look at it as, as a trade issue. I mean, Russia worldwide has always been that same way. It's like, how many guns do you need? Like, who's your enemy? Let's find that wedge issue where we can insert ourselves and we'll be that, that military force uh, on, on the side of changing government. I, I think that that's probably old, old, old history now. You know, and, and Russia's going to have to figure that out uh, because they still do it. And I don't think people are interested in, in, in that kind of engagement in their country, un- unless they're hell bent on, on having a war. Uh, but I think, you know, in Afghanistan, that type of, of gunboat diplomacy just simply wouldn't work. Um, I, I'm just cautious of time here. Uh, we're at the sure. hour mark. Are you, ca- are you comfortable with going for a few more minutes here, John? Sure. Absolutely. Please. Awesome. 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 So I, there's two last topics I want to talk about. I, I've cut down the list of things that we want to talk about. So the next thing we want to talk about is government censorship. And the last parliament, the 43rd parliament here in Canada, so we're back in Canadian territory, uh, the, the liberal government, the Canadian government introduced Bill C-10. And I want to make sure I get the correct name of here. The An act to amend the Broadcasting Act to make consequential amendments to other acts. We have the worst naming system in this, in I think, in the world of our, like, can we just have, like, the Patriot Act? How hard is that? Like, come on. Um, <laughs> some, and some on the right might say that this is government censorship 101, and they're comparing this bill to China. Uh, I, I want to get from your perspective, because you seem like someone who knows a lot about uh, uh, world issues and how things play in the world. Bill C-10, when you saw it, when you uh, first heard about it, what was your initial reaction? Was it the government trying to censor the general public and what we say and what we do on the internet? Um, you know, I think when it comes to, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and how they're controlling content and the fact that CRTC is playing such a, a, a broad role in terms of that interpretation, I would throw that under censorship 101. And, and, yeah. and I really just, dis, I dislike it. But the other piece to this thing is, you know, you take a look at Disney, you take a look at uh, Amazon, uh, you take a look at um, um, Netflix, you know, in terms of those streaming sources. To me, that's just about money. 
I, that, that's just about a government wanting their, their, their share of the pie uh, because they have, they have wants from these companies. And these companies are saying like, I, I, sorry, we're, we're not interested in your want. Leave us out of this bill because it's just not something we want to play in. Um, so, but I think that's about money. And, and, and I think that that's about trying to replace revenues from the conventional uh, uh, companies like Bell and, and Rogers and, and uh, uh, you know, who are finding more and more people cutting their cable access. And so much money was being generated in terms of having, having to go to uh, Canadian content. This is just replenishing those monies. And, and, and so to me, it's just a tax grab on the one side, censorship on the other. So I, I, I want, I'm, I'm going to challenge you on this one here for a second, because uh, in Canada, we have CanCon, Canadian Content, yeah. uh, CRTC, where we ask our broadcast services, even if it's a broadcast service is not streaming, because the act is, that's what literally the act is about to amend, to say you need to have at least a certain amount of uh, Canadian content to uh, be considered Canadian content and to air in our country. Does... Is this not just the government trying to protect our culture, our individuality? Because we are so heavily influenced on the culture of America when it comes to broadcasting, whether it comes to services like Netflix, Amazon uh, Prime and Disney Plus. Is this not the government just saying, okay, guys, we, we need to make it fair for Canadians because we are seeing an influx of American content again, and we need to just step back and let Canadian content, Canadian artists, Canadian users be seen again on a different platform that they once didn't have. Because that's where I'm thinking it's coming from, but I could be up the creek without a paddle because, you know, it's my show and I'm, you know, usually, I th I th I'm usually wrong about these things. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that there's a piece of that, but if you take a look at the production uh, uh, numbers for uh, Netflix, uh, it's one of the largest producers of Canadian content out there. And they're doing that because it's an attractive place to do um, to do business and to film and and to uh, attract actors that are are prepared to work in Canada. And so the question I would ask is that if it's if Netflix is already one of the biggest producers, why are we asking them for things like um, uh, uh, revenue numbers and um, what are your expenses and how many subscribers do you have and you know why don't we just simply let them continue to um, uh, build Canadian content. Like if you go into Netflix and flick Canadian content, you can watch as much Canadian content as you want to. You don't, you don't have to be burdened with um, uh, US uh, produced or European produced uh, uh, content. Uh, so, you know, I, I, the, the question I would ask is that if, if the main producers in the past, historical, don't have the same type of viewership and, and this is the new viewership, if you're going to feed Canadian content, you have to put a tax in place to get that money. And that's why I say this, this is just about replacing uh, legacy money that, that just simply isn't there anymore. Um, and I think it's been acknowledged that Bell and, and uh, Rogers aren't contributing as much as, as they have in the past, uh, because the number of people that are watching their products uh, is less and less. Cable, cable to me is, is, is like the landline. You know, kind of a cool device in its time, but why would you need one today? I, I still have both. <laughs> like, I, I, feel like <laughs> I feel like an old man now. Like, wow, I've, I've never been thrown yeah. under the bus so late in an episode before. But wow, <laughs> I, I still have a landline. I call people from it for, on my office line. And I still, have, I still have cable because I like to watch CNN and PBS from time to time, which I realize now you can get it on a streaming service. So... Maybe I will be canceling it in the new year. Um, Canada's not the only one who's been censoring its uh, content, though, and censoring its uh, the what uh, information gets put in. And Australia, like we literally uh, mirrored Bill C ten off of a bill that went through the Australian Parliament. Is this the way that we're going? Is this the world just saying, okay, guys, maybe we need to squash the angry hate that is social media that is content being produced where it's inciting violence that is islamophobic and we just need to just take a chill pill or are you comfortable saying that content is there for anyone to access and it should not be censored by the government 
You know, I, what I worry about with the government is overreach because they, they, it, it is just the way they do business. And uh, do I wish that that hateful content wasn't on the internet? Uh, yes, I do. But I also believe that I have a responsibility to myself and to my family uh, to put, um, uh, to have a discussion around what's on there and, and what does it look like? And, and, and um, you know, I, you know, personally, I, I'm not involved in, um, uh, in Facebook or, or um, uh, Twitter or Instagram, because in a lot of cases, I don't want to read that. And, but I still use Google and, and uh, uh, because I think it's a, it's an incredible search engine in terms of it's, it's a window into the world. And, and I would not want any level of government to screw around uh, with, with how I go about uh, living my life in, in terms of my search for knowledge. I agree. But, you know, there's an interesting thing. I don't want to take this off topic, but this is really kind of cool. As you remember in, in, in Australia, the Australian government wanted um, um, Facebook to, to start sharing um, uh, the Revenue. news costs. Yes. And, and there was this big, you know, push pull, you know, who's in charge, you know, the government was, was, was adamant that they were going to, uh, uh, there'd be dire consequences if Facebook, Facebook didn't, didn't come on, on uh, side uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the government on this. And then one day they wake up and the, the news, both, both local and uh, international is no longer available to Australians. It's just been turned off. And the interesting thing about that, and, and, and well, Facebook now says it was oversight, when people went to, to find government uh, applications for various services and, and that sort of thing, they couldn't access them because they were no longer on the Google search engine. And the, the Australian government was absolutely uh, livid uh, with Facebook that they, they, would, they would actually do something like this. But I, but I think it was a really good lesson because one of the things that I ask myself about these companies dealing with Canada, if they don't like this legislation, there's only 37 million people in Canada. Do we need them more than they need us? True. But the, the follow-up to this, and this is, this is where I get people angry at me, is you are a publicly traded company or meta as it's now called facebook twitter instagram whatever you want to call it Do, does that not mean that you are a public service to ensure that what is being put out and how it's being put out is being regulated correctly because that is my concern that there are people putting out shitty content and my, my podcast is not one. I love, I, I love Facebook because it's a great way to get my show out. Um, please don't cancel me, Facebook. Um, <laughs> is, is it not the, the, the requirement of these companies now to do a service for news organizations, for governments, because they are now a public service for everyone and anyone to use to get their information. Because people, as much as you joke that I still have a landline, I joke that you still have, you, you still use Google because I don't think a lot of people use Google anymore. I think people go to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to find their news and find their information. So is it not the responsibility of the organizations like Facebook, Twitter, and, and our social media uh, companies to ensure that what they are putting out is fair and accurate or no? You know, I, I think um, uh, fair and accurate sh should be the baseline for anything that, that gets done. Uh, so that, that's an easy yes. But uh, the question <laughs> though, the, the, the question though is that the changing nature of the way people absorb news is, is different than it was. And people are looking for a one stop, one source and um, if it wasn't for Google or Facebook or, 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 or any of the other platforms in, in terms of that information being compiled and made available um, uh, to the public, where else might they get their information? Because we're talking about generational change here. You know, if, if I could go back and, and, and get a broadsheet and, and read the newspaper and have a cup of coffee, I, I'd be a pretty happy guy. But I've I have so moved on from that 
in, in terms of I sit down with a cup of coffee in my computer and, and I'm off to the races. And um, so the only question I would say is that if you don't want to share your information with, with a Facebook or, or uh, um, Google, then develop an app, make it free, have it embedded as, as, as a need to, to, to read in the morning, and, and, and you're off to your races uh, in, in terms of your content being read. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I think these media sources, they, 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 they want it all. It's like, um, we want to do the research. We want to control the content. We want to control the opinion. We want to control what people read. Oh, and by the way, we don't have a mechanism that is easily, uh, available, uh, to, uh, millennials and, 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 and various other, uh, uh, generational, um, uh, reading needs. It just, it just strikes me that. I, I, maybe it'd be better off if Google just bought out um, a, a, a newspaper chain and, and just changed it all to, um, um, Google to a digital format. Yeah. And, and, and that's what you get. Don't know. It, it, that's a really tough question because I, 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 one of the things about Google is you get such an interesting cross section of information available to you. In, you can read two articles about the same subject and, and, and it have a different opinion uh, by the, uh, uh, the journalist that uh, wrote it. it. You have touched on a subject that I could go on for about an hour and a half about journalism integrity and journalism uh, uh, Journalism, just journalism integrity, like, I'm sorry, but there is a lot of people out there and a lot of journalists out there who are good, who are great. I'm not dissing all of them. I'm just saying that sometimes editorial boards do have a lot of, lot of sway around journalists and what they write and how they write it. And I hate that. And I hate the fact that we are now in a society where it is left, right, left leaning news and right leaning news and not the news of the 19, like when I was growing up the 80s and 90s, when news was news, when you got the content and it was true and it was accurate and not slant it one way or the other. That's a whole new, a whole nother area we could talk about, John. Maybe, maybe we should have started with that instead of COVID. <laughs> uh, but we will end with uh, kind of back on COVID here. And that is the ramifications of COVID and the aftermaths of, aftermaths of COVID. During the COVID-19 pandemic, governments across this world were giving out money left, right, and center to those people who were left jobless because their jobs became redundant or not needed. So they were sent home and they were sent home to sit on the couch and their income was literally brought down to zero. So the government had to step in and give money to people who were struggling. This has caused a run on the printing of money, and this has caused inflation to be a topic of discussion at the end of 2021. If you would have told me in tw at the beginning of 2021, we would be talking about inflation, I would have said, you're probably right, but not as bad as we are seeing in Canada and the United States. Inflation has caused grocery prices to go up, has caused uh, house prices to go up, and we are not, we are just at the start. And I do not, and I say that lightly. Is inflation a natural entity of this world? Because inflation always happens. It happened 15 years ago when the 2008 economic crisis happened. It happened in the 90s. It happened in the 80s. Is it just the time that inflation occurs now? Well, to, to your point, I mean, we, we have created an inflationary world and, um, you know, part of it is the way we have gone about um, dealing with certain uh, economic issues uh, or social issues within the country. And I think the other piece is, you know, is, is, you know, back to the whole supply chain in terms of the availability of goods. Uh, you will pay more for a good that you can't find if you believe it's important that you have that particular uh, um, uh, product. But I think that, you know, the inflation is, it's the timing of inflation. I, I, I think that that's what's startling people. You go through a time where you're not spending any money on goods and services, quite literally, because there are no goods and services to be had. You, you basically buy groceries, you're at home, uh, you know, you're, you're living a fairly solitary life. And then you finally hit this breakout moment and suddenly you can't find the goods that you're looking for. And the goods that are available are, are, are priced in accordance with scarcity. 
So I think that that's the one side of this thing. The other thing that I don't think we, we talk enough about inflation is the inflation we create ourselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things like um, your, uh, your gas bill when it comes in. And, you know, you take a look at, at, at what the gas is that you burn in your home, for example, furnace, fireplace, what hot water tank, whatever, whatever you got going in it. And then you suddenly, you know, find that, that, you know, 80% of the price has been inflated so everybody can make a profit on it. And then you find that there is a, a, a further environmental tax on it um, that increases the cost of natural gas um, uh, even further. And, and to me, that's the other kind of inflation that we have in this country in, in terms of like, what is that we do to ourselves here in, in terms of making it more expensive? Gasoline has gone up for sure. There's, there, there's no doubt that, you know, the refinery margins are changing. The profit at the gas station has changed. But why wouldn't it? Because the government take on it continues to expand. You got the municipal government getting a couple of cents on it. You've, you've got the provincial government taking a chunk of it. You got the federal government taking a bigger chunk of it. And then you've got um, uh, an environment, environment tax on top of it. Nobody says that we should take away the environmental tax or that the federal government should take less or the provincial government or the municipal government. What we're saying is that we want, we want Petro Canada to generate the fuel in the station for next to nothing and sell it for next to nothing, right? Like the profit margin is always blamed on, on, on the producer. And, and I think that inflation is, is really caused by the way we behave with commodities, whether it be marijuana, whether it be liquor, uh, whether it be gasoline, you can call them all the sin tax if you want to, but, it, but at the end of the day, if they're all more expensive, that contributes to inflation. This, this, this time around, there's a lot of more, lot more people struggling and because a lot of people were out of work and a lot of people are still trying to get on their um, feet. Is this going to show a divide in our culture worldwide where the richer are going to get richer and the poorer, the middle class are going to struggle worse than they have ever done in any inflation? Because I remember back in that 2008, we navigated that quite well under Stephen Harper, but there were still people who fell through the cracks. This time around, it looks like there's going to be more people falling through the cracks, whether that be here in Canada or around the world. I hope not, but I'm looking at the tea leaves and the tea leaves are telling me that people are struggling and they're going to be hit the hardest because of this naturalized inflation, whether it be inflation through excess taxes that we don't need, whether it be uh, global demand on products that uh, people did not need a few months ago, but do need now. How how are we going to get through this as a one country, one world people instead of a me first world, America first, a Canada first uh, mentality? Yeah, I I think that some countries like like China is 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 a country unto itself, and you know I think Russia the same way. I think the United States is 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 heading in that direction. But I, I, I think the bigger issue is that, that the wealthy are so wealthy. And I'm not talking of seeing wealth. It's, it's something far beyond that. You know, when you take a look at, 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 at the, uh, that the money billionaires have, have amassed, uh, whether it be through this COVID time or whether it's just, you know, they've hit a, across a, you know, electric vehicle that everybody wants and, and they're making incredible sums of money. Um, like how much is too much now? And, and I think it's a question we need to ask of some of these billionaires in terms of, you know, you, you have so much money that, that, that people like us can't even fathom what, what the, the, that type of wealth. But, you know, when you drag it down to, you know, kind of our level, you know, I think that we have inequities all through this system. You know, we, we have more and more people who aren't paying taxes because they're, 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 they're not generating enough revenue or the amount of money that they get from the government in, in, in payouts is greater than what they would contribute in terms of their tax. And then you got this beleaguered middle class that have nothing left. So you add on, you know, the spiraling costs of buying a new home or buying any kind of a home, uh, you know, and, and that's going to be a real killer in this country in terms of, you know, if we think that people have uh, food insecurities, 
there's going to be a housing insecurity here that's going to follow along right behind it. My thing with inflation is that there seems to be this mentality worldwide that interest rates have to go up to cool the economy. I think that's crazy. I, I think that that just leads to further um, uh, spiraling of, of inflation because you're taking, you, you, you're then saying, we're, gonna, we're going to raise interest rates so you buy less. People are struggling to buy now. And, and, and so you raise interest rates and who's the beneficiary of raised in, interest rates? Okay, so I, 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 I'm glad you talked about housing pricing for, prices for a second because it's a topic that I wanted to bat back and forth to someone and you, you mentioned it. So you are literally going to be in the hot seat here, John. Um, <laughs> as a homeowner myself, I'm happy my house price has gone up. I'm sorry, but I'm happy that my the equity in my house has now gone up. So when I go to resell it, it's going to give me more money back into it. Yes, the market is probably not there to have a lot of people buying. But if I sold my house today, it would be worth more than it was when I bought it. So I'm, I'm thinking inflation in that respect is good because as a homeowner, I'm getting more money. Uh Am I out to left field on this one or am I just completely like, is there a lot of other people, homeowners, like thinking the exact same thing that I am? Oh, there's a lot of people, including myself, who think the same way. I, okay. I'm really pleased that the value of my home has gone up. I think what we're talking about here is, is, a, is affordable entry level housing. And I think that that's really where the killer in all of this is, is that, you know, you take a look at, you know, Calgary, for example, what was the average price of a home? $450,000. Yep. In a world of 40, in the world of 40% taxes and in a world where the cost and maintenance of, of, of your home um, rise unabated, uh, it is very, very difficult if you're a graduate from a, a local university and you're looking at your first job, you're thinking, like, where am I going to rent? It just seems so far out of scope in terms of your ability to get into a $450,000 home. Maybe what we need, and, and I'm not, I, you know, put these homes anywhere. Uh, maybe we need a $200,000 uh, walk-up row house uh, as an entry-level home. And maybe we need to build um, 100,000 of them across the country and, and, and give people an opportunity to get into the housing business so like everybody else, you know, they can move through the progression of, of homes and in, until they find the one that they like. And then when they're at their end of their life, they can start the progress uh, exactly the opposite direction. Uh, but I think that that's what it is. I think, you know, the cost of living, the cost of buying an automobile, the cost of maintaining an automobile, the cost of a house, the cost of maintaining a house, it's pretty daunting for somebody who's looking to get into the marketplace. And I think that that's the piece that we want to address. Not necessarily whether you're living in a, you know, an $800,000 home. Um, you know, if you've earned, you've earned that progression to get you to the home that you're in. And, and I think that that is a Canadian dream. I really do. I think that's a Canadian dream. I've always thought about that as something that uh, it's, it, it's an accomplishment. And, and I would think it would be unfortunate if the government took that away from us. But I also started off with a very small home. First one I bought about 700 square feet and it was affordable and, and it got me into the marketplace. So I, I think that that's, that's the gap. I, I, I completely understand now. And I, I thank you for clarifying that for myself. Um, I am just cautious of time here and I have one last question for you. One last question and then I will wrap it up. And that question is this, and it's sort of a open-ended question and it's looking forward. We are on the cusp of 2022. What do you think 2022 has in store for Canada and the global uh, market and the global governments? You know, I think uh, in Canada, I, I think we're, we're, going to, we're going to have to address issues like productivity and, and the way we get things done in this country. Um, I think we're going to have to reconcile the fact that we have uh, three level, levels um, of or sorry, three levels of um, nationhood in this country. And what does that mean to us as Canadians? I think you've got the, the Indigenous nation. I think you've got the Quebec nation. I think you've got the rest of Canada. And, and how do we get things done? 
how do we get things built? Who owns what? Um, I think we're going to have to reconcile to the amount of debt uh, that we've taken on uh, because of COVID and, and, and the increased debt. And, and I think we're going to have to look at societal needs in terms of um, once you've given Canadians all of this access to money and, and services, at some point you have to pay for it. And, 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 and I think that we haven't hit the crux of, 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 of where we are as a country, because I, I, I think it's a disservice of a prime minister to say, uh, it, you know, the budget will balance itself or, or you know, his latest tirade on, on uh, uh, don't worry about where the money is coming from. That, that's not your concern, that's mine. Uh, well, that's all of our concerns. And, and uh, you know, Canadians are different than, than, than the Americans in terms of, you know, we want to manage our business. We want to know where the money's coming from. How does it get repaid? And uh, uh, so I think, that, I think that, you know, from a Canadian standpoint, that's kind of where we're at. I, I think that, you know, globally, I think we need to, we're, we're, we're going to hit a wall with inflation. I, I think it is, it, it, you know, if you take it inflation, you take debt. Um, if central banks choose to raise interest rates, I think you're going to see debt servicing become a bigger and bigger part of where money gets spent and something will have to give there. And, and um, you know, I think that there's going to be some questioning in terms of, well, who should pay this debt back? You know, because I, I don't know about you, I, I went through this and, and I'm very thankful I did. I went through this whole pandemic and not a check showed up at my door. And I'm actually quite pleased with myself for having put together a plan that allowed me to weather these kinds of storms, uh, you know, in terms of, of the way I've configured my life and, and the way I put a financial plan together, uh, because you know that these kinds of, of interruptions are going to happen um, uh, in a country. So I think globally, I think that that's the big issue that you're going to have is, you know, what do countries do when they run out of money? You know, we saw the bailing out of like Italy, for example, by uh, the European Union. All of these countries have taken on huge amounts of debt and, and uh, they're going to have to pay the bill for it at some point. So I see that. And I also think that there's going to be the, the push pull in terms of um, how do we balance our environment uh, with the way we are living our life today? Like, how do we manage that transition from heating our house with a furnace to heating our house with um, thermal heat or uh, hydrogen or, or whatever? Because I think that there's no compromise left anymore. The people that are pushing the environmental piece of this want it done tomorrow. And the people that don't uh, are called some name and dismissed and it, because, you know, you're, you're not with the program. And, and I think that, uh, I think worldwide, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that you just can't on a dime switch something that's been institutional uh, for as long as it's been. And, you know, of course, I think the world is going to have to figure out, you know, what, what, what does the tax burden look like and, and who's going to pay for it? That, that would be kind of, that, that's, you know, kind of high on the economy and short on, on, on societal issues. But uh, um, yeah, that's kind of where my mind's at tonight. I, I want to thank you for doing this because uh, I have I have sparred with Jen a few times on this show and I, I enjoy it quite well. We always say we're going to be an hour and that never ever happens. So I could I should have expected that when I sat down with her sparring partner, it was going to be the exact same. It was going to run a little bit longer than it originally anticipated. But John. Uh, I want to say thank you because uh, we are, this is episode 101 of season three. Uh, this is our last Wednesday, Wednesday episode of uh, 2021. And as this is, uh, for anyone who's listening to this, my very last interview, uh, as I've pre-recorded a lot of interviews, but this is my very last interview before my surgery tomorrow morning, Thursday, December 2nd. So this is being recorded December 1st that night. So John, this has been an honor and a pleasure. And I, I, I'm so happy I was able to do this because it has put my mind at ease going into tomorrow. So thank you so much. Chris, thank you. I, I so appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to engage in this conversation with you and uh, you know, good luck tomorrow. I, I hope, uh, hope everything works out uh, just perfectly for you. Thank you. Um, 
as always to my listeners and to my viewers if you haven't already hit the subscribe button on youtube head over to facebook twitter instagram as john does not like but head over there and follow us along and if you want head over to patreon and donate three dollars a month to keep the show going on in 2022 uh for everyone here at the cross border interview podcast have yourself an excellent rest of your wednesday and we will be back thursday morning with our entertainment rundown of the biggest entertainment news stories of 2021 have yourself an excellent rest of your day and talk keep talking